GMAC, Vice Chancellor, DDC, my fellow academic, Dr. Willem, colleagues, the incredible choir, fellow students, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to be here tonight to at, as of like, at a university named after us of Python. I thank the organizers of the Northern Cape Writers Fair for inviting me and um, you know there, there, there are things that happen and you don't know how they happen. Your vice chancellor happens to, the only place, place he knows in Nigeria happens to be my hometown where I grew up. <laughs> so um, in fact inviting him back to that town to come Go back to the university where I am. It is a pleasure to be here. I want to start my talk by speaking really about politics and literature. The dream of politics is to achieve its aims no matter what it takes. The dream of literature is to achieve its aims through means that are humane. Yet, the same set of people have always been drawn to both politics and literature. It was the late Chief Bola Ige, then Governor of Ondo's of Oyo State in Southwest Nigeria, who said that politicians and writers have the same clients, the people. He was addressing the inaugural conference of the newly formed Association of Nigerian Authors at Obafemi Aulowo University in 1981. Both politicians and writers care for their people. Both who wish to do something, material, spiritual, something useful for their people. Both politicians and writers sacrifice even their families in the process of caring for their people and in service to them. Perhaps these and other still unmentioned things draw writers to politicians and politicians to writers. In terms of achieving their aims, the politician does the impossible immediately, while for the writer, miracles take a little longer. The politician envies the writer's longer lasting achievements, while the writer wished his writing could perform his or her desired miracle immediately. There have been intriguing friendships between politicians and writers, such as the one between the Colombian writer and Nobel laureate Gabriel Garcia Marquez and the former Cuban president, the late Fidel Castro. Near at home, we have uh, the friendship between the governor mentioned earlier and the Nigerian Nobel Prize winner, Wally Shwenka. Two other examples are worth mentioning. There was the one friendship between Andre Marot and Charles de Gaulle, who was president of France. And then there was the friendship between Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was president of Egypt, and Mohammed Hesinein Eko, editor of the authoritative al Quran for 17 years. Yet, there are few studies of the writer-politician fascination that I know of. The most famous will be Fidel and Gabo, a portrait of the legendary friendship between Fidel Castro and Gabriel Garcia Marquez by Angel Esteban. My conclusion is that when it comes to the layer of power, art, all art, constitutes rituals hoping to achieve political miracles. 
Dreams. I wrote The Ritual Dreams of Art as a young editor years ago. Other than, that, uh, other than its title, nothing remains, and there was nothing to remind me of its content until I met Sue Plucky. I read and reread Native Life in South Africa. Then I had to teach Moody his 1930 novel that will set the mood for many African writers from outside of South Africa in the 50s and the 60s. I'm talking about the most Tutuola and Chino Achebe, who will follow the path that he had beaten with his only published novel. Of course, I read, this other, I read his other writings in English, including the diary of the city of Mafia King and Loss of Journalism. The politician and the writer in Soplaki got me looking for that short essay of long ago. The search for that essay and for Soplaki brought me to South Africa more than 25 years ago. To say that Soplaki was a politician and a writer combined is saying nothing new. What might not be familiar is the idea that he viewed his political frustration at the hands of racists and segregationists as merely a temporary delay in the achievement of a humane society in South Africa. Not only that, he then concentrated on his writing and used the writing to prophesy the future of his dreams. So, my topic for today is the power of politics, the power of literatures, so plucky, and the madness of making humanity shudder. Acknowledges that it is in South Africa, more than any other African country, that hope powers are best demonstrated. My topic also acknowledges the writers and the politicians who made it possible for me and my family to come to live in South Africa from February 1992. <clears throat> I came to South Africa a year short of my 50th birthday, an age at which some people are preparing to retire. Although I came to teach initially at the University of Western Cape and later at the University of Stellenbosch, I came as a student of African politics. I had been a student in Cairo, studying Arabic and Arab theater and cinema. I had been a student, if only for a short time, um, uh, at the University of Dakar, uh, uh, learning French. I was familiar with both the Arab Africa as well as French Africa. Coming to South Africa will complete my education in terms of the politics and literatures of Africa. As an undergraduate student at the University of Ibadan, I had met Zek Mahlele and read his Down Second Avenue. I read also a work in the night by Alex Laguna, with whom I share one point. Both of us had been invited to the, at different times, of course, to the late Soviet Union by the Soviet Writers Union and Progress Publishers of Moscow, him in 1978 and myself in 1983. Before then, I had read Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton as a secondary school text and recited the first page from memory to my classmates. There is a road, there is a lovely road that runs from the top of the hills. These hills are grass covered and rolling, and they are lovely beyond the singing of it. But the rich green breaks down, they fall to the valley below, and falling change their nature. For they grow red and bare, they cannot hold the rain and mist, and the streams are dry in the close. I arrived as a student, a postgraduate student in African politics and literatures. My teachers were Dr. Frederick Van Slavat, sometime leader of opposition in the Apartheid Parliament, Joe Matthews, son of Z.K. Matthews and father of Nale Bipando, all political activists and writers. And among my writer teachers are Mandla Langa and Jubilo Nebele. Others are Breton Bretelbach and Anki Krog. Others are Kerot Pese and Kosisile, who died while I was away, 
and what is security. No other country has more writer politicians, politician writers than South Africa. This, I think, this, this, I think, is, is partly the reason why the salvation of both the oppressed and the oppressor became a major issue in the struggle for the liberation of South Africa. South African writer politicians have set themselves the near impossible task mm. of liberating not only the oppressed, but as well as the oppressor. It is not stated so bluntly, of course, the task of African freedom fighters to liberate the African oppressed and the European oppressors of, of the Africans. Rather, the freedom fighters diluted the purity of the struggle by admitting of the friends of the Africans, or friends of the oppressed, just as other freedom fighters had diluted their struggles at the liberty. Towards the end of Moody, so Clark is only historical novel, our author shows his disillusionment with this situation. The Baralong had joined the Bora to defeat the enemies of Zilikazi. In taking his people further north to a new settlement in Bulawayo, Zilikazi curses the Baralong from generation to generation. And I quote, the Bekwana know not the story of Zuminga of old. Remember him, my people. He caught a lion's web and thought that if he fed it with the milk of his cows, he would in due course possess a useful mastiff to help him in hunting valuable specimens of wild beasts. The cub grew, apparently tame and meek, just like an ordinary puppy. But one day, Zuniga came home and found what? It had eaten his children, chewed up two of his wives, and in destroying it, he himself narrowly escaped being mauled. Chaka served those just as treacherous ways like as dynasty now, extinguished by the very bullets to poison by wives and our consumers today. Betwana are fools to think that these unknown, unnatural keywords will return their so-called friendship with honest friendship. For when the keywords rob them of their cattle, their children, and their lands, they will weep their eyes out of their sockets and get left with their empty throats to squall, to squeal, being for mass. In San Domingo, where the slaves were fighting the enslavers, the French, they admitted the help of Les Amis de Noir, the friends of the blacks. But this was only at the beginning. Once it became obvious that Napoleon and his money bags were bent on restoring slavery to the island, it was a fight to finish a finish that will make humanity shudder. In January 1801, the leadership of the slave army ordered that every white person, child, woman, man, aged, must be killed. Every white person was killed, and the new Asian constitution decreed that no white person may ever land on Haiti at the pain of death. The horrendous crime did make humanity sure, so much for depending on the friends of the oppressed. The South African freedom fighter, besides accepting the role of the friends of the oppressed from among the oppressors, tried to make the oppressor realize the futility of segregation and apartheid. First of all, that it will never work. It will, be, it will not be manageable. <coughs> That was the first thing. The second thing was the need to be aware of what was called the revenge of the oppressed on the oppressor, such as took place in Haiti that made humanity sure. On Juvenera, a day is coming when the servant becomes the master, and the master becomes worse than the servant. Things were much, much simpler in the rest of Africa. There were the colonizers and there were the colonized. The freedom fighters here have to free the colonized and God help the colonizer who can get lost as far as the liberated ex-colonized Africans were concerned. 
And invariably, the colonizers had somewhere else to go. Who they could go back to the mother country, or else um, they could go back to Australia, another colony still undecolonized. In the case of South Africa, the Bura had no European home to return to, even if he wanted to go. More than 300 years and thousands of miles separated him and his family from his 17th century family. The South African Native National Congress sank. Later, the African National Congress was formed in 1912, benefactor of other earlier attempts. Between 1913 and 1948, Africaners perfected, fine tuned their initial hesitant segregation policy into their bold apartheid system. They took land, they took security, they took education, they took even initiative from the African, all expressed in the most cynical English language, latest land act to plan from the natives. Native labor regulation, which tightened the process of how the whites control and deploy the labor of the natives. The Mines and Works Act reserved some categories of work in the mines to whites. The Dutch Reformed Church Act prohibited Africans from being full members of the church. And the Union of South Africa united the Boers with the Britons against the Bantu. Before then, the Peace of Berenike, which ended the anglo bear War, later named the South African War in 1902, marked the commencement of segregation and sector development. This was organized prejudice, inherently dangerous and violent. The liberal political system holding in the Cape, which the Plucky hoped would, would be extended to the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, were wiped out wiping out the hopes of Africans of some means. Next followed the courts. They were made to bow to the wishes of the whites. From this time onwards, it was clear to the politician writer that the struggle as previously made was over. During the anglo Boer War, both the British and the Boer had refused to let any of the natives allied to them in the war have access to firearms. It was obvious to the Boer and the Briton that the way things were going in South Africa, the Bantu would still fight the combined forces of the Briton and the Boer. So, why would they arm the natives? So, Plucky was the first general secretary of the South African Native National Congress. And for the next four to five years, he worked assiduously without any payment for the Congress, when in 1917, he was offered the presidency of the Congress, now named African National Congress. So Plucky rejected the offer. The reasons given for Plucky's refusal are, one, the need to attend the well-being of his family, and the necessity of re-establishing his newspaper business along with his uh, writing profession. I would suggest that there was a third reason. Blackie had followed the writings and the reasonings of John Tengo Jabavu, editor of Umbo. In its issue of 23 April, responding to a hostile editorial in the Bloomfontein Express, Jabavu warned of the dire consequences of the continued oppression of Buras of Africans living in Transvaal, and predicted that in the event of war between the Transvaal and the British Imperial government, the African tribes of Transvaal, Transvaal on whose neck the foot of the oppressor has been pressing with inhuman severity, will rise for revenge, and a sin might ensue which will make humanity shudder, but which must be expected when the host of conquered savages finds an opportunity to bust his bounds. Plucky never forgot the phrase about making humanity shudder. Here, we must not forget that John Tengo de Bavo was one of the few Africans who did not see anything particularly wrong 
with the Natives Land Act, he was compromised. Can we say captured by white financial support? <laughs> For such a mistake, he was punished severely by his people, the Africans. Having exhausted all the possible actions to stop the creeping policy of segregation and apartheid in South Africa, both at home, that is in South Africa, as well as in Britain, so Plaki knew the struggle would need to take a new format. He also felt that it should not be the way of making humanity shorter, as was to happen in the workers' paradise that had been declared in Russia in October 1917. It is to be noted that the Socialist International had said in this issue of 8 June 1917 that, quote, the natives are exploited and ex oppressed, not really as a race, but especially as workers. To accept the leadership of the Congress was either to continue the path that had led to failure, that is appealing to the humanity of the oppressors, or to change the tactics of the struggle completely through the path of danger and violence. So, Blackie quotes the speech of Dr. A. Abdurrahman, then leader of the African Political Organization and member of the Cape Provincial Assembly, part of which must have chimed with his general feeling that the Africana along the British had abandoned the path of political righteousness by organizing prejudice as government. And I quote, the restraints of civilization were flung aside and the essentials of Christian precepts ignored. The northward march of the bootrekkers was a gigantic plundering raid. Talking of appeal weariness, so Plaki says, the time will come when these leaders retire of spending their own money in paying fares to the government railways to render free services to a government with taxes done to pay other people lavishly for the similar work, while it does not even tender them so much as the word of thanks. Further down the page, Soplaki says, these cruelties caused by the Native Land Act are euphemistically <coughs> described as the first step towards segregation of white and but they might have truthfully been styled the first steps towards the extermination of the blacks. Obviously, pleading humanity to people who want to exterminate you is not the right or sane action to take as a response. British newspapers as well as members of, the, of both the British Houses of Parliament are quoted in full in native life in South Africa to show that the black protesters were at the end of their constitutional option. Here, Mr. Doha, described as the Secretary for Native Affairs, says the African must sell his stock and go into service. It is time that Parliament gave some attention to his obligation in regard to the South African native. He has no vote, he has no friends, only his labor, which the white man wants, on the cheapest terms. And the white man has got this by taking his land and imposing on him taxes that he cannot pay. In fact, the black man is rounded up on every side. And if, as the deputation suggests, may be the case, he is forced to acts, to acts of violence, it will not be possible to say that it has not been abundantly proven. One of the British newspapers wondered at the inability of the British Empire Parliament to override the South African Parliament in terms of the Natives Land Act, and asks if that Parliament were to legislate the restoration of slavery in that part of the British Empire, would the mother of Parliament keep quiet? Quote, it is surely impossible to admit that Great Britain can do nothing for the mass of the native population, although at the moment it appears to them that they, that though they are subject of the king,
He cannot even hear their appeal, and we do nothing for them, and has abandoned them a state of affairs which is quite incomprehensible to them, and leads them to depend solely on themselves to obtain redress. And that way lies revealed. Yet, Sopaki was too much of a struggle artist to know that the time was not right. The military option was not available to them. Those who took the leadership could do nothing until the 50s and the 60s. The Yoruba culture cautions, of, cautions each family and each people to look after their mad men and mad women because of the day they will have to face the mad men and mad women of the other families and other peoples. Only the madmen and mad women of Haiti could have ordered the slaughtering of all white and all women, men, children, and age that generally more than 200 years ago. At the same time, it is the madmen and the mad women of the Boros who insisted on complete apartheid and the separate development that saw white people controlling the possibilities and the destinies of Africans. If for now, the madmen and the mad women of the Africans have not emerged, it is because of the writer politicians who would rather save both the oppressor and the oppressed in South Africa. As some of Thomas Sankara, former head of state of Burkina Faso, would say, you cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. In this case, it comes from non-conformity, the courage to turn your back on the old formulas, the courage to invent the future. It took the madmen of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today. Mm. Mm. I want to be one of those madmen. <laughs> Close quote. Sankara was killed by his bosom friend, Kampaori. Writers may be inspired and be possessed, but they are not mad enough to do with the humanness. So Plaque loved his people. In fact, one of his biographies is entitled Love of His People. This one is written by Sete Madara Mulema. Politics needs and uses money, it uses arms and population. Invariably, the oppressor controls all these people. To participate in politics and liberate himself or herself, the oppressed must acquire this. Oppressors manipulate the means of acquiring money, the means of acquiring arms, and the means of acquiring people. They do everything imaginable and unthinkable to prevent the oppressed from acquiring money, arms, and people. They divide Africans into tribes, ethnic groups, language differences, racial identity, identities, gender isolations, and sexual orientation. Literature has truth, justice, and charity. What it says is very able, is very fearful by all. It ensures that the weak are not oppressed and all are equal before the law. It treats all human beings with kindness and tolerance. No wonder. Politics, politics effect is said to be hard power. With late rituals, soft power. Politics effect is immediate, the teacher's effect is indeed a long war to freedom. First World War came in 1914 and lasted until 1918. It provided another opportunity for Congress, the African National Congress, to first help the British, the British Empire, to defeat Germany with the promise of freedom in South Africa from the end of the war. The Congress even sent delegates to Paris to present the case of the natives to the peacemakers of Europe. By now, the British had come to agree with the Bura that the natives would be kept in their place with the help of segregation and later apartheid. Every appeal made for the British Parliament to override the South African Parliament was rejected. Members of the Congress delegation returned to South Africa with the exception of supply. He stayed in London to see if he could sway the opinion of the British public to make their government, make the South African government to change their policy of segregation. 
and separate developments. He failed. In the introduction to the American edition of Native Life in Africa, uh, uh, Native Life in South Africa, published in 1998, Neil Pearson of the University of Botswana says, Blackie returned home to Kimberley to find a South African Native National, <coughs> National Congress with spent force overtaken by radical, more radical forces. Blackie became a lone voice for old black liberalism. He turned from politics and devoted the rest of his life to literature. So, so Blackie then concentrated on literature. He spent his energy on his work on foreign language issues and the translations of the plays of William Shakespeare and the Swami. But he did not forget the following poem by Haki Madhubati, born Don Lee, African American poet, and I quote, I ain't seen no poems stop a 3.3 age. I ain't seen no stanzas break a honky's head. I ain't seen no metaphors stop a tank. I ain't seen no words kill. And if the world was mightier than the sword, Pushkin wouldn't be fertilizing Russian soil. And until my similes can protect me from a night steak, I guess I'll keep my razor and buy me some more bullets. Thank you very much. African tribes of Transvaal, Transvaal on whose neck the foot of the oppressor has been pressing with inhuman severity will rise for revenge, and a sin might ensue, which will make humanity shudder, but which must be expected when the host of conquered savages finds an opportunity to bust his bones. Plucky never forgot the phrase about making humanity shudder. Here, we must not forget that John Tenbrook de Balvo was one of the few Africans who did not see anything particularly wrong with the Native Land Act. He was compromised. Can we say captured by white financial support? <laughs> For such a mistake, he was punished severely by his people, the Africans. Having exhausted all the possible actions to stop the creeping policy of segregation and apartheid in South Africa, both at home, that is in South Africa, as well as in Britain, so Plucky knew the struggle would need to take a new format. He also felt that it should not be the way of making humanity shorter, as was to happen in the workers' paradise that had been declared in Russia in October 1917. It is to be noted that the Socialist International had said in this issue of 8 June 1917 that, quote, the natives are exploited and ex oppressed, not really as a race, but especially as workers. To accept the leadership of the Congress was either to continue the path that had led to failure, that is appealing to the humanity of the oppressors, or to change the tactics of the struggle completely through the path of danger and violence. So, Plucky quotes the speech of Dr. A. Abdurrahman, then leader of the African Political Organization, a member of the Cape Provincial Assembly, part of which must have chimed with his general feeling that the Africana along the British had abandoned the path of political righteousness by organizing prejudice as government. And I quote, the restraints of civilization were flung aside and the essentials of Christian precepts ignored. The northward march of the bootrekkers was a gigantic plundering raid. Talking of appeal weariness, so Plucky says, the time will come when these leaders retire or spending their own money 
in paying fares to the government railways to render free services to a government with taxes done to pay other people lavishly for the similar work while it does not even tender them so much as the word of thanks. Further down the page, Soplaki says, these cruelties caused by the Native Land Act are euphemistically <coughs> described as the first step towards segregation of white and black. But they might have truthfully been styled the first steps towards the extermination of the blacks. Obviously, pleading humanity to people who want to exterminate you is not the right or sane action to take as a response. British newspapers as well as members of the of both the British Houses of Parliament are quoted in full in Native Life in South Africa to show that the black protesters were at the end of their constitutional action. Here, Mr. Doha, described as the Secretary for Native Affairs, says the African must sell his stock and go into service. It is time that Parliament gave some attention to his obligation in regard to the South African Native. He has no vote. He has no friends, only his labor, which the white man wants on the cheapest terms. And the white man has got this by taking his land and imposing on him taxes that he cannot pay. In fact, the black man is rounded up on every side. And if, as the deputation suggests, may be the case, he is forced to act to acts of violence, it will not be possible to say that he has not been abundantly provoked. One of the British newspapers wondered at the inability of the British Empire Parliament to override the South African Parliament in terms of the Natives Land Act and asks if that Parliament were to legislate the restoration of slavery in that part of the British Empire, would the Mother of Parliament keep quiet? Quote, it is surely impossible to admit that Great Britain can do nothing for the mass of the native population. Although at the moment it appears to them that they, that though they are subject of the king, he cannot even hear their appeal and will do nothing for them and has abandoned them, a state of affairs which is quite incomprehensible to them and leads them to depend solely on themselves to obtain redress. And that way lies with them. Yet, Sopaki was too much of a struggle artist to know that the time was not right. The military option was not available to them. Those who took the leadership could do nothing until the 50s and the 60s. The Yoruba culture cautions, of, cautions each family and each people to look after their mad men and mad women because of the day they will have to face the mad men and mad women of, the, of other families and other peoples. Only the mad men and mad women of Haiti could have ordered the slaughtering of all white and all women, men, children, and age, that generally more than 200 years ago. At the same time, it is the mad men and the mad women of the Boros who insisted on complete apartheid and the separate development that saw white people but controlling the possibilities and the destinies of Africans. If for now, the madmen and the mad women of the Africans have not emerged, it is because of the writer politicians who would rather save both the oppressor and the oppressed in South Africa. As some Thomas Sankara, former head of state of Burkina Faso, would say, you cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. In this case, it comes from non-conformity, the courage to turn your back on the old formulas, the courage to invent the future. It took the madmen of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today. I want to be one of those madmen. Close quote. Sankara was killed by his bosom friend, Kampaori. Writers may be inspired and be possessed, but they are not mad enough to do with humanness. 
so Plaque loved his people. In fact, one of his biographies is entitled Lover of His People. This one is written by Siti Madara Kulema. Politics needs and uses money, chooses arms and population. Invariably, the oppressor controls all these people. To participate in politics and liberate himself or herself, the oppressed must acquire this. Oppressors monopolize the means of acquiring money, the means of acquiring arms, and the means of acquiring people. They do everything imaginable and unthinkable to prevent the oppressed from acquiring money, arms, and people. They divide Africans into tribes, ethnic groups, language differences, racial identity, identities, gender isolations, and sexual orientation. Literature has truth, justice, and charity. What it says is variable, is very fearful by all. It ensures that the weak are not oppressed and all are equal before the law. It treats all human beings with kindness and tolerance. No wonder. Politics, politics effect is said to be hard power. With late rituals, it is soft power. Politics effect is immediate. Literature's effect is indeed a long war to freedom. First World War came in 1914 and lasted until 1918. It provided another opportunity for Congress, the African National Congress, to first help the British, the British Empire, to defeat Germany with the promise of freedom in South Africa from the end of the war. The Congress even sent delegates to Paris to present the case of the natives to the peacemakers of Europe. By now, the British had come to agree with the Bura that the natives would be kept in their place with the help of segregation and later apartheid. Every appeal made for the British Parliament to override the South African Parliament was rejected. Members of the Congress delegation returned to South Africa with the exception of Sopan. He stayed in London to see if he could sway the opinion of the British public to make their government, make the South African government to change their policy of segregation and separate development. He failed. In the introduction to the American edition of Native Life in Africa, uh, uh, Native Life in South Africa, published in 1998, Neil Pearson of the University of Botswana says, Blackie returned home to Kimberley to find a South African Native National, National Congress a spent force overtaken by radical, more radical forces. Blackie became a lone voice for old black liberalism. He turned from politics and devoted the rest of his life to literature. So, so Blackie then concentrated on he spent his energy on his work on Swana language issues and the translations of the plays of William Shakespeare into Swana. But he did not forget the following poem by Haki Madhubati, born Don Lee, African American poet, and I quote, I ain't seen no poems stop at 3.38. I ain't seen no stanzas break a honky's head. I ain't seen no metaphors stop a tank. I ain't seen no words kill. And if the world was mightier than the sword, Pushkin wouldn't be fertilizing Russian soil. And until my similes can protect me from a night stake, I guess I'll keep my razor and buy me some more bullets. Thank you very much. <laughs>